At the risk of sounding blasphemous, you don't actually need John chapter 21. There's some good information here, there's some good stuff here, it has a lot of interesting material, but there's nothing actually new that is learned from this text. The big takeaway from John 21 is the, the if you want to call it restoration, the restoration of Peter um, and the, the reconciliation and the uh, getting over the awkwardness of what happened when Peter denied him three times, the, him being the Lord. That's really the biggest takeaway. There's another miracle that is mentioned, the miracle of the second miracle of the fishes, slightly different from the first one. Um, but for the most part, there's nothing really here that's, that's it's, it's nothing more than a coda, if you will. It's, it's a little tag at the end of the book. John could have ended with chapter 20 and that beautiful little uh, statement he said, um, Jesus did many miracles that aren't written, but these are written that you might believe. That, that's a good ender. But yet he continues and he says, but there's a little bit more I want to share with you. He says in chapter 21, after these things, the things which we just read about, the two previous visits, the one without Thomas and the one with Thomas. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise, this is how he showed himself. They were together, Simon and Peter and Thomas and Nathaniel um, of Cain and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that be James and John, and two other disciples. So you have eight of the twelve, sorry, eleven. Judas has been killed or killed himself. So eight of the eleven are together now fishing. Because Simon said to them, I go a fishing. They say to him, We'll also go with you. So they went forth and entered to a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. We're not told exactly how much time has passed after um, the, the discussion between Jesus and Thomas, you know, touch my hand inside and don't be faithless but believing. We know that happened uh, eight days after his uh, ascension, or excuse me, resurrection. So he rises on the first day of the week on a Sunday. On Monday later, uh, we have a conversation with Thomas. And now some amount of time has passed before we read about um, Jesus with um, these other disciples, many of whom we've already talked about. Um, so the time has passed, but not too much time, because he's not on earth very long. After um, 50 days is Pentecost, and he had already ascended since then. So we're at some point within a few weeks. Um Verse 4, But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, and the disciples did not know it was Jesus. They're on their boat. It's early in the morning. They see this figure there. He has either concealed his face or there's enough distance. They can't make out who he is. And they don't know it's Jesus, but this person is there. And he calls out to them, verse 5, Children, which is um, probably a, a simple term that is used by older Jews to refer to younger Jews. It's just a way of saying, Young men, you gentlemen, um, have you caught any meat? Do you have any... Thing, if you caught anything. And they say no, thinking they're talking to a stranger. They just say no. Verse 6. And he says, why don't you cast your net on the right side of the ship and you'll find. Now this is almost verbatim what Jesus said at the very beginning of his ministry when he met Peter and he says, have you caught anything? And he says, no, we'll cast your net on the other side. And they say, we've toiled all night. We haven't caught anything, but because you said so, then uh, we will. That's Luke chapter 5. Um, so same situation here. Now it's been three years. They've gone through a lot. It's possible they're not making the connection, they're not remembering, but I think John has a hint of it. Cast you on the other side and you'll find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw for the multitude of the fishes. Suddenly, providentially, miraculously, there is a multitude of fishes just on this one side of the boat, and their net is, is straining to pull them all up. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, Peter, uh, sorry, John, says to Peter, it's the Lord. He says this, we, you, you would think, under his breath, based on what we'll read in a moment. He just kind of nudges him and says, that's Jesus, that's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girded his fisher's coat unto him, because he was naked, which in Jewish culture just means he was wearing his undergarment. Um, it was just a bunch of dudes hanging out in their underwear. Totally normal, completely normal in this culture. So he puts on a coat, and he jumps in the water, which seems kind of silly. If you're going to jump in the water, what are you putting your coat on for? That's Peter. So he jumps in the water to swim to the Lord. Verse 8, he leaves the other disciples in the little ship to come to the shore. For they were not far from land, but they were 200 cubits. And they were dragging the net with the fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw fire and coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. The Lord's already prepared breakfast for them. Jesus said to them, Bring the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land uh, full of great fishes, 153. And there were so many, yet the net was not broken. If you remember the first miracle of the fishes in Luke 5, they had so many fish that the nets broke. And I think that's significant because Jesus was making them no longer fishermen. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You don't need to catch fish anymore. Your nets are even broken now. So forget that. 
I'll let you catch men. This is not the purpose of this miracle. So the net doesn't need to break here. The net holds the fish because Jesus wants the fish. He's the one in control here. Um, verse 12, Jesus says to them, come and dine. And none of the disciples asked him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. So at some point, the, the miracle is, is obvious enough. They know who they're dealing with. But it started out with just a little thing between John and Peter, but news spreads fast. 13. Jesus then came and took bread and gave them, and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he rose from the dead. That's significant that John gives us that. It gives us some context so that we're not left to wonder, were there other times when Jesus met with the disciples between tw uh, chapter 20 and 21? And that's not the case. He, he met with them. He met with them again with Thomas present. And now he meets eight of the eleven here um, uh, after a fishing trip. Verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. He doesn't call him Peter, which is the name he gave him. He calls him his birth name, his given name. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? That these being the other disciples. Do you love me most? Is all he's asking. Now the word love here that Jesus uses is agapeo, which is do you have a servant's heart, a, pre a preparation, a desire to give yourself completely over to me. You have that kind of strong, uh, purely sacrificial love for me. Peter, though, answers and he says, Yea, Lord, you know that I love thee. That word love is phileo. Lord, you know that I am crazy about you. I am passionate. I am zealous in my love for you. Nuts for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. Um, serve Serve, in other words, I'm calling you to a work. 16. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape on me? Do you love me enough to sacrifice and serve? And he said, Lord, you know that I phileo. You know that I'm crazy about you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Serve. He said to him the third time, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And at the hearing of it the third time, it says that Peter was grieved because he said to him three times, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you knowest all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I think it's very telling that, um, that we're told that Peter was grieved after three times. After three times, which is the same number that Jesus was denied by Peter. Jesus now asked Peter the same number, do you love me? Because with each denial, Peter showed that he did not love Jesus, at least not as, as much as he's supposed to. He cared about his own life. He cared about protecting himself. But now Jesus is saying, do you love me more than anything? Three times to reconcile himself back to Peter and Peter back to himself, I should say. Um, forgive yourself, in other words, and move on. Let's, let's move ahead and let's start anew because you have work to do in the kingdom of Christ. And so um, Peter gives this impassioned, lengthy statement. You know that I love you more than anything. So Jesus just gives the simple feed my sheep. And that's the end of it. Simple as that. But Jesus continues with something else. Verse 18. Verily I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked wherever you would. But when you shall be old, you'll stretch forth your hands and another will gird you and carry you whether you would not go. Peter's future is not to be a prisoner. Peter's future is to, is to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Peter, you're going to be killed. People are going to lead you where you would not want to go. And they're going to stretch your hands. I think that's a, a crucifixion illusion. Uh, they're going to stretch forth your hands and take you where you would not want to go. And so, I'm calling you to serve, Peter. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, my little sheep. Um, but recognize that in this act of service, in this agape, in this sacrificial love, you're going to be called to pay the sacrifice. And Peter does it. He goes and he sacrifices. He becomes a zealous evangelist for the Lord, one of the great ministers, uh, ministers, and minister, ministers and missionaries for Jesus. And in the end, he does. He loses his life, but he does so happily. 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. Follow me. It's, it, you got to take up your cross. He said that to all of us. But he says it to Peter, literally. You're going to take up a cross and follow me. Tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down. Because when they told him he was going to be killed, he says, I don't want to be crucified the same way my Lord was. Crucify me upside down, which is more painful. Because I'm not worthy to die under the same banner. That my Lord died. It's, it was a sense of honor um, to, to die for Christ, but he wasn't worthy to die in the same way. So turn me upside down, where it's much more painful and crucifying. Either way, that's how he was killed. Verse 20. 
And Peter, turning about, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. He turns and he sees John, just right behind him, who leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrays thee? All that is just the reminder of who this person is. He's the guy at the Last Supper who asked about the betrayer of the Lord. And so Jesus and, and uh, John and Peter, they've been very close. John and Peter also were very, very close. And, um, you know, they shared many experiences together. They were there together as they followed Jesus at his trial. Uh, they were there on the boat just now, and John says, hey, that's Jesus. They, they're close-knit. And so Peter turns and sees John walking, and Peter says in verse 21, what shall this man do? You say, I'm going to die. I'm going to have my hands stretched out. I'm going to die. What's going to happen to him? Well, that's just classic Peter. It's none of your business, Peter. What's going to happen to him? Don't worry about it. But that's Peter. He thinks without speaking. <laughs> he speaks without thinking. Verse 22, Jesus says, if I will that he tarries till I come, what is that to thee? You follow me. I told you to follow me. Don't worry about John. If I want John to live until the day I come back from ascending, then so be it. That's what will happen. In other words, it doesn't matter. But from that little statement, people ran with it and started saying that John is going to live forever, which is why John has to clarify that in verse 23, which is probably a big reason why he included this in the first place, because a lot of people were saying that about John here in the 90s of the first century. So John had to say, this. then went this saying among the brethren, that the disciples should not die, that I'm not going to die, John writes. Yet Jesus did not say he shall not die, but he said, if I will that he tarries till I come, what is that to thee? All he said was, if it's my will that he lives, then so be it. But that's obviously not going to be his will. John died toward the end of the first century. Um, the point was just, don't worry about it. You take care of you. You follow me, is the point. 24. This is the disciple which testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know his testimony is true. I was there, John says. I heard it. I know what he meant. I know who he was. I know what he did. He's the Christ. 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose the name of the world itself could contain the books that should be written. John says, I could keep going, but I'll stop. If I kept going and I kept writing and I did live forever, I lived all the way until the very end and I had an unlimited supply of ink and paper and I could just write and my heart's content, the world would fill up before I ran out of material to say about all that Jesus did, all that he was, and what was so special about him and what is continually so great about him, our resurrected king. Well, that's how John ends. That is the end of the Gospel of John, beautiful account, a beautiful summary of the life of Jesus as told by that apostle, focused on some specific miracles he did in the first half of the book. Um, which proved his uh, Messiah uh, ship and his Christhood, and then the sacrifice that he offered on the cross, focused on in the second half of the book, that shows us what he did as the Messiah and as the Christ. He gave up everything so that we could have everything. So that is the Gospel of John. <clears throat> we'll pick up with our next study. It's going to be a look at the minor prophets from the Old Testament. We'll start that study next time. Until then, thank you very much.